Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Central, it's great to be with you, and I'm so excited to be a part of this series, Ceasefire. I don't, you, don't, you don't need me to tell you that our world is a world that is just is laced with conflict. Uh, we've got political conflict, there's kind of ethnic conflict, there's tribal conflict, all over the world. There's, there's always some kind of mess somewhere, some kind of hot spot, some, some, some flaring up. A lot of times we see it in our neighborhoods, or we see it in our schools, or we see it uh, sometimes, unfortunately, even in our own homes. Part of the question that we're going to be asking here together today and over the course of this series is, what, what does it mean for us to be sowers and advocates and builders and makers of peace? So I want to look at a scripture that kind of breaks down one of my most favorite ceasefire moments in scripture together. You probably heard of a story of a kid named David and this giant that he killed named Goliath. Uh, David is a scrappy young shepherd boy, and when we get to that point in the story... Saul, the prophet of Israel, has already heard from God. Uh, sorry, Samuel, the prophet of Israel, has already heard from God that Saul, the current reigning king, is going to be disqualified from future leadership. And while he's still living, another king in waiting is going to be anointed. And so Samuel gets led by the Holy Spirit to the house of a guy by the name of Jesse. Jesse parades all of his sons in front of him, and the Spirit tells Samuel to anoint David, even as a young man, as the future king of Israel. So some of you know the story, David goes into combat against this mighty Philistine warrior Goliath, and when he kills him, he skyrockets to national Israel fame. In fact, the story goes that when young women were welcoming the warriors back from the battle, they had written a song, and the lyrics for the song were, Saul, the king of Israel, has slain his thousands. And then they said, and David has slain his tens of thousands. So um, if you're Saul and you're a little bit insecure, and people write a song that starts trending on the charts that says that your rival is ten times more popular than you are, what does that do to your fragile ego? Yeah, it, it starts to unravel a little bit. And this is where things go from okay to just downright ugly between David and Saul. We read in 1 Samuel 18 that Saul was prophesying in his house, and David was playing the liar as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Now, I've worked for some temperamental bosses in my day. None of them have tried to kill me twice. I don't know about you, but like after the first one, I think that's when you file a complaint at HR, right? And after the second time, that's when you dust off your resume. You're like, see you guys, I'm not coming back ever. Like, I'll pack my own cardboard box. No need to call security. I'm out of here. David doesn't do either one of those. In fact, David, as a testament to his tenacity and resilience, remains in harm's way. And just to make things extra dramatic, he marries Saul's daughter, making him the family son-in-law. So rather than getting away from the person who's trying to kill him, he gets pulled even tighter into the family orbit. But Saul keeps trying to kill David, even though he's married to his daughter. He sends David into a battle that he hopes he will lose. This is a trick that David will try later uh, against a dear friend of his named Uriah when he becomes king. And he commands his son and his attendants to kill him. And when these plans fail, he tries to kill him again himself. 1 Samuel 19 says, when David was playing the liar again, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. Um, as soon as the spear like goes through the drywall, you know that somebody is serious about their rage issues. That night, David made good his escape. To those of you who are keeping score at home, this is the fifth time, the fifth time that Saul has tried to kill David. So David flees to the desert, and over time, 400 men who are looking for community, who are looking for a mission, who are looking for a cause and a leader to wrap their life around, they, they find David and rally around him. And for some time, Saul and his army and David and his men play this game of desert, cat, and mouse. And this is where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 26. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakalah, which faces Jeshimon? 
So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with 3,000 select Israelite troops. So these just aren't like rank and file in infantry. These are special forces caliber soldiers. To search for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakalah facing Jeshurun, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Ab Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. Then David asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zeruah, Joab's brothers, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. And Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. So picture this for a moment. Saul is sleeping in the middle of a batch of 3,000 men. We don't know if this is exactly how they set up their camp. But when we look at the Old Testament in the book of, books of Moses, we learn that when Israel set up their camp and they were moving through the desert, they would always take the most important part of that camp and put it in the middle. And all of the divisions would encamp around it. So they would put Moses and the Ark of the Covenant in the middle so it would be protected from any kind of attack. So if they're following that model, you can imagine that Saul is camped in between four divisions of 750 men. So imagine David and Abishai having to tiptoe through over 700 sleeping bodies to get to the place where David is. And when they find him, he's asleep with his weapon stuck into the ground. Now imagine that for a second. If you're David, what do you think when you see Saul's spear? What do you think when you see Saul's spear? Like if this is a movie and I was directing it, I would go into flashbacks of every time I have dodged that spear when it is coming my way. Do you think, like, there should have been a trigger warning on that scene for David to be able to say, like, hey, not only the person who tried to kill you, but the weapon that he tried to execute you with is sticking in the ground right here. When you're David, what do you feel in that moment? Do you think that there was a flood of emotions? Do you think there was frustration? Do you think there was anger? Do you think there was rage? Do you think there was disappointment? Because here it is. Not only is Saul trying to kill him, but David's been on the run for, at this point, likely years. And he could bring all of this to an end if he follows his buddy's advice and just takes Saul out here and now. Abishai offers to kill him in one blow. Is David within his legal rights as a warrior to kill Saul in this instance? I would say if somebody has threatened your life five times, and if they're, act, if they're only in town because they're trying to kill you, as a warrior, you're probably within, like, the warrior code to take him out before he takes you out. But David teaches us an important lesson. Just because he can take revenge doesn't mean he should. Just because he can doesn't mean he should. I've got a September birthday, and I am a sucker for fast food apps that give you free food if you accumulate points. Yes, thank you. I hear that, and I affirm it as a gift from the Lord. And, um, and I, I got a notification from one of these guys, right? And they're like, hey, uh, you get a free cheeseburger for your birthday, but you, got, but you got to cash it, and it's only good for another 24 hours. In my mind, I'm thinking, like, do I usually go to this place? No, but if it's free, I should take advantage of it, because if I don't, that would be poor stewardship, and that would make God sad. And, and then, I, then I started to think, I'm like, well, these, this particular cheeseburger, it's entirely delectable. Like, it tastes really good going down. And then also, 15 minutes later, I realized that I've made a horrible life choice. You ever, ha you ever have that with some things in your life? Like, they taste really good going down, and then an hour later, you're like, I should not have done that. Um, that's exactly how revenge works, isn't it? It looks sweet. It appears sweet. It tastes sweet, and an hour later, or a month later, or a week later, you're like, that was, that was a poor decision. And that came at a cost for my mental and my spiritual health and my relationships. See, so we live in a world that sometimes says that if you can do what you think you want to do in the moment in which you can do it, you should always do that. But David shows us how restraint, self-control, is evidence of his godliness and his righteousness. 
Verse 9 says, David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die. And he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. David understood what we often forget. It is possible for you to respect the role, even if you don't trust the person. So David respects the office of king, even though he doesn't trust the person who is king as far as he can throw his socks. And there is... A really important lesson here is like, I can respect and honor the value and dignity of another person who is created in God's image, even if it is not wise for me to trust that person with my safety or my resources or my relationships. Just because he was a dangerous and broken and sinful person doesn't mean that David believed that he had the right to be his judge, his jury, and his executioner. David had the wisdom to be able to say, I, I'm going to let God handle Saul the way that God wants to handle Saul. David doesn't pull punches because Saul is a good guy. Make no mistake, he is not. He does so because God has put Saul on the throne and he believes that only God can take him off. David says, if today is my day to be king, then God will remove Saul instantly. He could do it miraculously if he wanted it to. He's like, or he'll just die from old age. At this point in the story... Saul is likely in his mid to late 60s, which in king years is like 140. He's like, or we're in the middle of the battle with the Philistines. He could die in combat. He goes, if God wants to eliminate Saul from my life, God will do that on God's terms, according to God's plans. I don't have to intervene. Because the scripture is full of stories of people that God had given promises to, but because God didn't deliver that promise on that person's timeline, they thought they would help God out. Anybody remember stories like these? Like remember Abraham and Sarah? God promised them a child. Sarah didn't think that the child was coming quickly enough. So she offered God a solution and her husband a short shortcut. She's like, hey, why don't you sleep with my maid and um, that child will carry on our family line. If you read the rest of the story, you know that that ended badly for everyone. So Abishai is trying to do the same thing. He's like, hey, David, you're going to be king anyway. The only thing that stands in your way is Saul. Saul's kind of a dirtbag. He's trying to kill you anyway. Just kill him, and we can accelerate the whole process. And David's like, that's not my call to make. That's God's and God's alone. So David takes Saul's spear and his water jug. He takes his weapon and his water, which is fascinating because what? Without a weapon, Saul can't hurt David, and without water, he can't survive in the desert. What statement is David trying to make? He's trying to tell everybody who is watching, I could kill Saul actively or I could kill him passively. I could kill him violently or I could just cut off his water supply. Either way, his life is in my hands and I'm giving it back to him as an expression of compassion and mercy and honor. Verse 13, David crossed the other side and stood on the top of a hill some distance away. There was a, a wide space between them. And he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who's like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord, the king? As surely as the lord lives, you and your men must die. Because you did not guard your master, the lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? David is saying like, Hey, Abner, head of the secret service. Hey, all of you guys that are the elite bodyguards, I have shown more regard for your boss's life today than you have. And what David is saying is, not only did I have the right to kill Saul, but if I had, all of you would have died as well. Either we would have killed you, or people that are part of Saul's line would have had you executed because you failed to do your job. Sometimes we forget that even though vengeance looks tasty, even though an expression of revenge feels appropriate, you don't get to stop the ripple effects of your rage. And you never know, you never know how one reckless act on your part could adversely affect the life of somebody innocent along the way. 
David is saying, if I kill Saul, it doesn't just settle things between me and Saul. It makes everything else messy for everyone. And David knew that if eventually he was going to be king, he needed these 3,000 select military troops on his side. If he wanted a peaceful transfer of power, he had to get his revenge in check so that he could remember the ultimate goal, which wasn't just settling the score, it was becoming king. And when we have our eyes fixed on our spiritual destiny, we don't settle for reckless actions and behaviors that would pull us off of that path. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, Lord King. And he added, What is my Lord? Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What wrong am I guilty of? Now let my Lord the King listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, may he accept an offering. Like if this whole thing of you trying to kill me is God's idea, then let's pray together and get that sorted out. If, however, people have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go serve other gods. Now don't let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And this is where things get interesting. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Here's the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on you, the Lord's anointed. As surely as I value your life today, so may the Lord value my life. And deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. Remember that spear that David is holding? What does he do with it? What would you do with it? I don't know about you, but if I was holding on to that spear, I would snap it over my knee. So that it couldn't hurt me or anyone else again. Or I would build a trophy case for it, put it on my mantle, and tell my grandkids about the time I stole a spear from the king of Israel in the middle of the night. What would I not do? The last thing that I'm going to do is give that back to the person who wants to use it to kill me. But that's exactly what David does. How much confidence does he have to have in God's sovereignty? In God's love and in God's protection for him to re-empower a person of violence. It's almost as if David is saying to Saul in front of everybody, I'm not afraid of you anymore. Even though you have the capacity to hurt me, you will not touch a hair on my head if God doesn't want you to. I had a buddy who was on a long forgiveness journey towards somebody who had hurt he and his family deeply. Had called his character into question, had threatened his earning power, had damaged his career, put his family in a really tight situation. And he had been praying, God, will you give me the grace to forgive? God, will you give me the grace to let go of all of the, the, will you release me from the bondage of this bitterness? And he said one night, as just, as he was praying that he could release this, he had a dream, and in his dream, The person that had been so dangerous, so toxic, so large, and so intimidating in his mind. He had a picture of this person in his dream where he was small and frail and bent. And when he woke up, he told me, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit was saying to me, he can't hurt you. He can't hurt you anymore. He can't hurt you anymore. And once he felt safe and grounded... In the sovereignty and the compassion and the wisdom of God, he was able to see that person as who they were. As somebody who is mortal, as somebody who is limited, as somebody who is constrained by God from inflicting any future pain on his life. If David had opted for revenge, if he had done what Abishai wanted him to, he would have missed out on a chance to model righteousness and faithfulness. If he had opted for a private execution, he never would have received a public apology. See, vengeance 
calls for you to see your enemy's bloodshed. But maybe the real spiritual victory is getting to a point where your enemy blesses you in front of everybody who has seen the situation unfold. How does the story end? The story, well, at least this chapter of the story ends with Saul telling David in front of all of Saul's army and all in front of David's army, in front of like 3,500 people who are watching, what does David say? He says, may God, I was wrong, I'm sorry, may God bless you and give you success in all of your future endeavors. What's a better victory? Seeing your enemy beaten down in violence or having your enemy bless you publicly in front of all of your friends and neighbors? What's a more beautiful picture? What's a more vindicating snapshot? What's something that gives more honor and glory to a God that's committed to reconciliation, restoration, and redemption? I want to ask you four questions this morning. The first one is this. Who is your Saul? Who is your Saul these days? Who is somebody who was or is actively trying to harm you? Second question. Will you choose to see his or her life as precious the way that David saw Saul's life? Even though he didn't deserve it. David said, as long as he's created the image of God, I don't have any right to inflict the harm on me that I want to in my flesh. If I see him as a person of value, I can change this. I can prevent it from escalating into something that it ought not be. Who is your Saul? Do you see their life as precious? Do you see them as a person who has value? Do you see them as someone who is created in the image of God, even if their behavior is abominable and atrocious. Will you trust God for justice? Will you trust God for justice? Or are you going to take that, are you going to take that out of God's lap? And are you going to seek justice and, on your way, on your timeline, and in your terms? And then finally, will you choose victory over vengeance? Just as David told Abishai to stand down with Saul, Jesus, thousands of years later, tells Peter to do the same thing on the night that he was betrayed. As Jesus is being arrested, Simon Peter drew a sword, and he struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. John tells us that the servant's name is Malchus. And in that moment, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Author and activist Shane Claiborne says that Jesus is the great interrupter of violence. Jesus came to stick a spoke in the wheels of vengeance so that it wouldn't continue to reach havoc on families and marriages and generations and tribes and nations. When Jesus willingly goes to the cross, he displays the righteousness and the faithfulness of his human ancestor David. He is the true son of David, who spared not just one of his enemies, but all of his enemies, including you and me. He is the one who endured ultimate violence so that he might ultimately defeat violence. He has suffered the ultimate injustice in order to win justice for any and all of us who have been victimized friend of mine says it's only at the cross of Jesus Christ where God's capacity to identify with our sorrow, display his love, and commit to his justice are displayed in a single image. And it's because Jesus operated in this way that the Apostle Paul can write these words to the church in Rome that are beautiful and valuable for us today. Which say this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And the hard news, my friends, is that like you and I, we can't do this. Like in our own flesh, in our own human limitations, in our own rage, in our own woundedness, we lack the capacity to drum up feelings of mercy, compassion, and kindness for those who have done us wrong. It's only Christ at work within us that can be who we cannot be to people who don't deserve our kindness or God's kindness, but God in his beautiful mercy does it anyway. So let me pray for us that God would lead us in the footsteps of not just the first David, but the ultimate David, the person of Jesus who came to see us not just reconciled to one another, but to God himself. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy for us. We thank you for your kindness for us. We thank you that the scripture said that when we were functioning as enemies towards you, when we were pursuing you in our sin, you, you withheld your wrath because you cared more about reconciling us to yourself than you did about revenge. God, will you give us the same spiritual eyes? Will you give us the same heartbeat? Will you give us the capacity to mirror the power of the Spirit who has a greater desire to see people restored than see people punished? God, give us the grace to loosen our grip on those people, places, and memories that pull us into a spiral of rage and malice and resentment. God, release us from the snares of anger that keep us from being the kind of people that we want to be and propel us onto a life that is marked by grace and mercy and kindness, that we might follow in your footsteps for your honor and your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name.
to God today. Amen? Amen. Hey, you can take next steps to get plugged in, find your community out in the lobby. There's still tables available if you are hoping to find a way to plug in and find family. But we love you. We send you out in the Lord's blessing and hope that you will join us again next week. Be blessed.